thank you for the introduction, which um, I could tell you thought was as exhausting as I thought it was on, on the way through all those different roles I've um, had in government, which I now try to suppress, because if you've ever been in, in government, you'll know uh, these kinds of things can at times uh, be aggravating, as we were talking about before, dealing with all the, the government agencies. But I certainly enjoyed my time, I have to say, uh, 18 years of it in, in politics. And I'm delighted, of course, to be with you uh, here today. I was invited uh, to come here by Sir John Daniels, who I'll come back to later on. I don't know if Sir John's in the hall, but thank you very much for, for the invitation. Uh, the reason he invited me is that Massey University has uh, Jubilee going on at the present time, where a uh, university that's been teaching at a distance for 50 years. And we are celebrating that this year. And he, what he wanted me to do was to come and link into the themes of the conference, that's access and success, and give you a perspective on that from New Zealand, a perspective from a university that is celebrating having done this job for 50 years and judging where it might be up to and where it might go to from here. So that's what I'll talk about. I'll be talking largely about uh, my, my university today. Now, on the subject of the Commonwealth of Learning, though, I just want to say some, some quick things about this. I'm a huge supporter of the, the Commonwealth. I think when you look around this auditorium, you're looking at a unique organization, unique in the sense that it brings together a group of nations that otherwise would not meet, and are really only concerned with collaborating and working together to try and resolve global issues. There is no other organization like this. I think it's unique, and I think we ought to support it in the way that we do. The second reason I like to be here is that the Commonwealth of Learning uses the word learning. Quite often when we talk about these issues, we talk about education or the schooling system, and forget actually we're talking about people's learning, which has come up time and time again in the discussions we've had so far. And that's what I want to talk a lot about today, is learning. Because quite often we focus on the form rather than the function of what we are trying to do. We try to fit our discussion into a particular form of education, when really what we're saying here is, how do we do this in a different way? We can't do things in the way we used to do before, and that means the form has to change as we pursue the function of, uh, of in this case, higher education. Now, the challenge that we are given here at this conference is this access and success challenge. I want to add one more thing to that. It's access, yes, we're all concerned with ensuring that people have a chance to get education, but we are also concerned that they succeed in it. But the third bit is, it needs to be a quality education. We have to be assured that people are accessing and succeeding in something that matters. If all they're doing is going through a system which is second rate, or not appropriate for them, then all the access and success in the world is not going to achieve the kinds of ambitions that you and I have for the people that we represent. Now, for me, as someone like you probably, who's been in education in one form or the other all their lives, you look to people who inspire you to try and achieve that access, success, quality notion. This is the person that has inspired me. He's a New Zealander. He was, uh, his name is Clarence Beebe. He's the person who, for a good part of the last century, oversaw the New Zealand education system. And he said this. I'll read it because I think it's a, a wonderful quote. Our objective, broadly expressed, is that every person, whatever their level of academic ability, whether they be rich or poor, whether they live in town or country, has the right, as a citizen, to a free education of the kind for which they are best fitted and to the fullest extent of their powers. So far as this from being a pious platitude, that the full acceptance of this principle would involve us in the reorientation of our education system. Now, Beebe's ambition is something I'm sure we share. The big question is, how do we reorient the education system so that we achieve the kind of goal that he is talking about here? Now, for Beebe, he was setting this vision out in the 1940s. It was a big enough challenge then in the New Zealand setting, but we are here today in the midst of the knowledge age, and we're asking how can we get access to a quality education system for all the people that we represent from early childhood right through to higher education. This is a much bigger ask than Beaver was confronted with, but I want to carry on with that kind of quote as I move through the comments I'm going to, to make today. Now, the challenge gets bigger, of course, because we're talking about mass education right through the whole system. 
and we're talking about lifelong mass education. So we're talking about not only supplying quality, access, successful learning to a larger and larger number of people, they want lifelong learning. And they are going to be diverse learners because there are so many of them. How do we provide mass, lifelong, diverse education is the challenge that we are faced with as well. Now, when we begin thinking about the notion of a knowledge society, we turn back to the education system that we're all familiar with, the one that's been around for a little while. And we say to ourselves, well, here's a model of learning which has actually been around for centuries on the whole in the higher education uh, sector. It's a system which is about learned staff teaching classes in classrooms, running tutorials, sending people to the library on a campus. That's the model that most of us are used to. And that's what's been happening in tertiary education for a long time and for most people is still happening now. Now the question is, if we're trying to supply an answer to that access, success, quality education system, is that where we can send people? Can we send the tens of millions of people who are going to pour into the system in the early part of this century into that kind of system? Is that a possibility for us to do? Now, as we know, one by one, countries are starting to say no for the very simple reason we can't afford it. We can't afford to have people coming into that traditional model of education, and as a result, we're seeing students being asked to pay substantially more in Britain at the present time. We're seeing fees of £9,000 being discussed, and as a result, we're seeing students protesting uh, against that. We're seeing governments that used to pride themselves on publicly funding their systems begin to move away from that because they say they can't afford it. And we're beginning to see, I think, the signposts of the future. That is, the old model, the traditional model, will not meet the aspirations for mass education or quality education as we're talking about here. Now, for some people, they have said, maybe we should turn to online learning. Maybe that's the answer for us. Well, maybe. Many of you are no doubt considering that kind of model for a way of handling the explosion of need. But there are many educational authorities who would say to you, we're not keen on this. We think that perhaps face-to-face -face learning in a classroom really is superior to online learning. Some governments won't accept on learning, online learning at all. If there's even one particular element in a qualification for some governments, they'll reject online learning. Others will say, yes, it's OK, but it's, it's not quite a good, as good a quality as what you might get elsewhere. So online learning, yes, it's an answer, but one that we know is challenging us as much as giving us a potential kind of answer. Now, perhaps the answer lies in going back to this notion of the knowledge society that I mentioned earlier. We're entering into a knowledge age, a knowledge society, and perhaps what we will find if we look back at that concept of the knowledge age, there's a potential answer for us as to how we might move forward. The Knowledge Society idea raises questions about the importance of education. It says we all have to have it. We all have to have access to knowledge. That's the key resource in this century, so we must have access to it. But it also suggests that we need to shift our understanding of what knowledge is and how we acquire it. And maybe in there lies a cue for us to say how we might move forward. Now, if we look traditionally, if we look at the traditional model of education at knowledge, we would say that knowledge is a thing that you have to acquire by going somewhere to get it, which of course is why education in the higher education sector has taken the form it has for such a long time. We've seen ourselves as going somewhere to get access to experts and libraries and so on to get hold of it. The knowledge age idea suggests that knowledge isn't a thing anymore. It's a process. It's a process that's constantly changing because as we live in this knowledge environment that we're in now, the knowledge is constantly becoming renewed, new things are created, ideas are becoming redundant, and we're now seeing this whole notion of a thing, knowledge as a thing, giving way to knowledge as a process, which suggests that you acquire things in a very different way. You now have to not just get hold of the knowledge, you have to know how to create it for yourself. You have to know how to apply it and use it. And that suggests that perhaps we can begin to shift the way that we teach and learn. And that, of course, is what's happening. Many of us have talked about that here. We're now moving into constructivist forms of learning, more collaboration, teamwork, interdisciplinary forms of learning. We now are less concerned with people rote learning and doing exams. We actually want them to understand fully how the knowledge works so they can 
work with it themselves and create the ideas themselves. This is a very different kind of proposition, which suggests that if we were to carry on doing things in the old traditional way, it of course would not work. Now, those kinds of changes that we're all now becoming familiar with are suggesting that we perhaps are now on the edge of moving away from our traditional form to begin to explore new ways as we try to work out how to educate such a large number of people in a quality way. And of course, added to this is this notion of technology. We are now seeing arguments that maybe suggest that technology is going to reshape and change the way that we run our education system. The innovations that we're seeing now seem to promise a different way of a teacher relating to a student and a student relating to a teacher and students relating to each other. There are new possibilities emerging here, but I would stress that this is about the technology being inserted into the new models of learning that are appearing, which are making it exciting and possible, but it is leading to something quite different. These new collaboration, these new constructivist styles of learning, married with the new technologies that are emerging, suggesting that there are new ways potentially for us to, to go forward. Now, I want to take all of this discussion that I've been suggesting is a new way of looking at education and take you through quickly the story I was asked to tell you about Massey University, because you'll see when I do that, that much of what we've been experiencing over the last 50 years is an illustration of the changes in the way education is thought about. Just to give you a little bit of a, a view of Massey University, we have three campuses. Uh, those are the first three uh, pictures where you can see physical buildings. One in a place called Wellington in New Zealand, which is the capital city. One in a place called Palmerston North, which is in the middle of an agricultural sector of the country. And one on the north shore of uh, the largest city in New Zealand, Auckland University. And the last one is an image that we use for distance learning. This is how you do distance learning in New Zealand. You sit in wonderful fields with daisies studying on your knee. It's a wonderfully bucolic vision of what you might do to, to study. Now, what you'll see is that in this university over the last 50 years, a lot of what we've done resonates with the discussion that I've just been uh, outlining. Our story starts in the early part of the last century at Massey University, when New Zealand was trying to provide access and success for teachers in particular, who wanted to be able to continue working while they were studying as well. And what lecturers did is they introduced a little category called exempted students and allowed those teachers to go home and study the same things that students were doing internally. To their embarrassment, they found that these teachers were succeeding to the same level as people were doing if they were internal students. This caused a little bit of disquiet because, of course, in New Zealand, as elsewhere, the notion of studying at a distance was something that people were unsure about in the early part of the last century. But as the number of people around the country started to find out about exempted students, they began to ask, too, can we work and can we study as well? So pressure came on the education system to bring in what was called extramural study. Not exempted students, but extramural study. Students who were allowed to study at a distance away from the campus for a period of time. Clarence Beebe, the man I mentioned earlier, is the man who introduced that. He suggested that's the way we should do things. This is part of the reorientation of the system, which will allow a larger number of people uh, to study. Now, the push to expand those kinds of opportunities meant that academics began to debate the whole idea of whether it was better to have face-to-face -face classes or whether it was OK for people to study at a distance in the way that was now uh, being suggested. That became a bit of a standoff between people who were for or against the style of study, something I'm sure most of you are used to in your countries in this debate as well. It was overcome in New Zealand in the early 1950s by establishing a new specialist college where these kind of students could go attached to, but somewhat down the road from, the early form of mass university in, in Palmerston North. Now, extramural teaching began formally on that campus in 1960. A very small number of staff, very small number of students, all very enthusiastic about the new model and very, very successful. Students accessed and succeeded in a quality system. The argument being put forward at this time was what was being offered was exactly the same as students who were studying internally. In fact, the university required its people to, to adhere to a, a principle called equivalence, 
that no matter where you were in the system, extramural or internal, you were going to get the same knowledge, same style of teaching, same exams, and guaranteed, therefore, that the quality assurance between the two was going to be uh, equal. Now, Massey University changed quite a lot during this period of time. 1960, it was still an agricultural college. By the time 64 turned over, it had become a fully blown uh, university under its own uh, piece of legislation. But that didn't mean the end of a debate. As is often the way, though, someone that Sir John Daniels will know, uh, Don Bewley, an individual, changed the debate. Don Bewley is someone I want to mention because for those of you who may have come across Don as somebody who's championed distant education for a long period of time, Don died recently. Uh, he was uh, a person who worked right to the end of his life championing this whole area of education and had a, a marked effect on the debate at this time at Massey University. What he did was very clever. He was credited the fact of what was called at the time a feat of diplomacy. That is, he tactfully said that internal teaching was preeminent, but the growth of distance learning was something that had to be paid attention to, and that seemed to relieve uh, most people's nerves. And as a result, what emerged from that debate was what was called the, the Massey model of learning, and this is the, the model. It was dual mode. Massey has always had a dual mode of distance kinds of, of learning, in the sense that it taught internal students and the same staff taught at a distance. So the same people were teaching both modes of education. Now that was important because those staff were then required to maintain the same level of quality, both externally and internally. They were required to not only uh, quality assure, but to quality enhance. They were required through their professionalism to do this. And one of the things that is special, I think, about the New Zealand model of, of distance education is that those staff wrote their own course, controlled their own course, they were always overseeing what was happening with their students and therefore had a real stake in whether both sets of students were succeeding in the way that they were expected to do. So the staff designed their courses, they went out to community-based learning. Uh, these, these are the same people who were tour the country holding short courses with their students and, and uh, towns all over the country. One of the, I did this for a while myself. It's a very special form of teaching. And those communities of learners were expected to get together themselves. So they would see a lecturer, but they would also spend some time uh, forming a little community of their own. They would come into the campus for short block courses as well. Uh, those were courses where people could meet each other. They often ended up marrying each other as a result of being in these courses. As you probably know, that's one of the functions of, of extramural types of education. And around all of this grew up a whole range of support services, people who were supported to uh, develop the materials, to teach, to support the students, to handle all their inquiries. A whole edifice begins to build around that uh, dual model. Now, the debate about the merits of internal and extramural teaching began and continued at Massey. But the dual model seemed to settle people's nerves, and people felt that the two styles could coexist. So by the time we reached the mid-1980s, extramural education was accepted by Massey staff as the way things should be done and widely accepted around the country. Enrolments continued to grow. The problem of managing that, of course, began to grow. The costs began to grow. But the university established the ability to teach anywhere, to examine anywhere, and I mean anywhere. If you're a soldier overseas working for the New Zealand Defence Force, you could sit your exam somewhere, as some of them are doing right now in places like uh, Iraq, those kinds of, of uh, expertise became a hallmark of what Massey University was, was trying to do. Now technology, of course, played a significant role in all of this. And I'll walk you through some of them and see if you can uh, place yourself in the hierarchy of, of uh, new technology. If you were to go back to the beginning of this education at Massey University, you were talking about cypher-styled notes, and I don't know if any of you remember this, but a Gestetner was uh, widely used by the university and a stapler. Those, those were the major forms of, of technology to put together notes, of course, to send them off to, to people. Now, those kinds of technologies, of course, were augmented by telephones, telephone conferencing, never widely used, really, at Massey University, never a popular way of doing things, but more recently, things like Skype or Adobe, Adobe uh, Connect Meeting, which allows people to interact in real time, those have been quite popular forms of technology. In the 1970s, 1980s, 
The university invested in its own television production centre, made its own programmes, a very elaborate process of sending out uh, videotapes to students so they could watch them either individually or in classes. That also never really became a huge way of, of doing things, even though it took a lot of uh, energy from staff. Major television channels had a look at the idea of establishing educational channels once again, never established a huge audience. And today, the use of um, education through, uh, th through the university would mainly for people to be able to access television channels on, uh, as they want to, to, to serve their, their needs when they're writing assignments. Now, at this point, what I want to, to just suggest to you, and from our experience, is that most of these technologies actually didn't change the teaching we did at Massey University. In fact, what we found over that period of time is that text-based, self-paced learning was what most students wanted and what most staff wanted themselves. The lesson, I think, from all of that is to say that technology doesn't necessarily solve the problem. If you've still got good self-paced learning that's text-based, as many people have mentioned, maybe it's a better way to go than investing in more and more uh, new technology. But of course, we began to move at that time into e-learning, computers, emailing, computer disks being sent out to, to students, teachers experimenting with digital media online, new materials began to emerge and of course, hugely popular. We moved into WebCT at the end of the 1990s. E-learning, in other words, became the way that people could see a genuine shift in the nature of their, their teaching. The one issue, of course, is the cost. This is hugely expensive to do, as people have mentioned before, and you need to be assured that you're getting good use uh, from your technology. Let me pause again about two quick points. I would argue that one of the things that distance learning has done is made better teachers of the people at Massey University. The fact that you have to teach at a distance makes you more conscious about your teaching you're much more aware of what you need to do to get a learner from where they are to where you want them to be than when you're in an internal class relying on traditional methods of just talking directly to teachers. I think the legacy of 40, 50 years of teaching, in other words, in this mode, has made Massey University teachers the best teachers in New Zealand and the New Zealand system, not because they're better academics, but because they've had more experience in thinking about how teaching will, will go. And for the students, it's been a revolution. In New Zealand, 250,000 people who would otherwise have not got access to education have got a qualification because of this. And they look like this. They are employed people. They are second and third chance learners. They are more likely to be mature. They are all over the country. Two, or three, two out of three are women. They usually carry an increasing workload as they get to see how this might help them advance their lives. Māori, the indigenous people of New Zealand, Pacifica, a large population coming from Pacific Islands, have used extramural as a way of getting into tertiary learning. They have begun to mix internal and distance papers, and as I say, 250,000 people have qualified. But you can put a face to these people. You can talk about people like this mother, who has a psychology degree, this fireman, who has got himself a human resources degree, this mother of a uh, group of children who got herself a teaching degree. This is Storm Uru, who is a person who's got a business degree, but is also a uh, world-class, just recently medaled in, a, in the um, uh, canoeing um, world championships in, in New Zealand. And this person here works in Hong Kong and has a business degree. You can put faces to these people to, to say they would not have got this qualification without it. They have lifted their qualifications in ways which have been useful to them and, of course, useful to the country. But most importantly of all, they've done this while they've been at work, raising a family and part of their community. That's what distance learning has done in New Zealand. It's allowed for continuity of social life while lifting the capacity of people right across our, our nation. Now, those faces are joined by this kind of experiment as well. We currently teach all around the world in 20 different countries. In Singapore, we teach, for example, a food technology degree. And the classroom that you can see there is a, a person, if you can see the screen at the front, he's teaching in New Zealand, in Palmerston North, into our campus in Singapore. Those students are interacting back and forwards with him, interacting with each other. And those, those, those same people who are on the screen come up to Singapore and teach block courses. On the other side of the screen is a contract we've just got with the World Bank, which allows us to teach students all over the world, both online and in block courses as well. In other words, the expertise we've got is allowing us to do more and more exciting things. So what's next? 
Let me very quickly unpack that uh, for you because I know my time is, is nearly up. Where we want to go next is to go back to the knowledge society idea. We think we've come as far as we can with the dual mode way of doing things, which has served us so well in New Zealand. So what we are now talking about is how we respond to living in the knowledge age by moving into more collaborative styles of learning, more constructive styles of learning. How do we do that is the question we're asking ourselves. And we've begun to talk about blended learning. In other words, what we're hoping to do is to make use of a combination of face-to-face -face learning and more online learning, or what we refer to as getting into a rich digital environment for, for the learners and trying to bring these uh, two things together. It's a huge challenge for us. We're having to go through a major academic reform process at the moment, which means that we are refocusing our entire academic offering and retraining our entire teaching workforce so that they're able to teach in this kind of, of mode. It means that we are experimenting with new technologies which might support what we are trying uh, to do. And our first move in that direction was to introduce what uh, we would, you would remember as the Moodle system. We refer to it to, as Stream because we've added some things to it. And what we've asked our staff to do now is to put all of their teaching into this uh, particular uh, learning management system. And we're training them so that they can use it as well as they, they need to. But on top of that, we are exploring all the kinds of things that have been coming up at this conference. Open educational resources, e-books, personal learning environments, mobile learning, cloud, all of these things we are referring to. Of course, we could go now to talk about all the individual technologies, but I'm not going to because, of course, you know them. And what we are finding is we need to sort through them carefully to say how do they support the pedagogical model that we are looking at, and most of them don't. Most of them are no use to us. They are flash-in-the-pan technologies. We are trying to carefully work through to the things that we want. Because remember this, that we are trying to develop a, a tertiary education system. One flash-in-the-pan piece of technology or an idea about how you might run your system does not create the full system. And that is what we all have to remember as we are designing the future for our, our students. In a sense, Mass University is returning to the whole idea of equivalence by moving to blended learning. We're saying what we would like to do is to ensure that whether you are learning on a campus or learning somewhere else, there's no real difference between your experience. You are both getting face-to-face -face contact and you are both accessing the rich digital environment which allows you to enhance the learning that you are doing. But beyond that, we would argue there's something else that we're after which is personalized learning. Once we've done blended learning, we think that the way forward is to keep focusing on what has been raised a number of times here, and that's personalization of learning, which is not individualization of learning. Learning is always social. What we're saying is, can we arrive at a time when, as I quoted at the beginning, when I was raising the, the quote from Clarence Beebe, can we arrive at a time when we can give people the education they are best fitted for and to take them as far as their talent will go? If we can do that, we will have personalized learning. At the beginning of the conference, I was listening to people talk about the importance of our job, which of course is to provide people with the educational experiences that they need to thrive and prosper in the 21st century that we live in. I wish you well with the work that you are doing. As I said at the beginning, I think we are a unique group of people who get together only for one purpose, and that is to do good collaboratively, collaboratively across the world. I hope what we can do together is share ideas, share experiences, and ensure that people do access successfully high-quality tertiary learning. Go well. Thanks for listening.